Hello and welcome. This is Saturday News at Noon. I'm your host, Keith Lander, coming to you from Dayton, Ohio, the Gym City, as it was once called. Well, uh, thank you for viewing the show, the last show. I appreciate all the comments. Uh, keep those comments coming. Uh, also, uh, share the show. You know, this is a uh, news show. We focus in on local news, national news, and uh, everything else in between, <laughs> I, I would say. And I uh, appreciate your comments. I, I really enjoy the, the thumbs up and, uh, and the encouragement that you give me. I appreciate that because uh, I do this show so we'd all be informed and uh, we'd be better um, make decisions based on some of these new stories. Uh, also, I want to say, uh, you know, I had a, a good friend, well, a friend of mine pass on uh, the other day. I uh, seen him one day and uh, uh, he was dead the next. So I just want to tell y'all, you know, if you, if, you, if you see folks, you haven't seen them in a long time, go past and say hello, because you never know when's the last time you see that individual uh, alive. And you never know when that person's going to see you alive, because we don't know our, we can't predict our, our, our death date. You know what I mean? We can predict the birth date, but we certainly can't predict our death date. And so sometimes you see a person one day and you won't see them alive the next day. So go past and just say hello. That's, that's the least you can do. And uh, I'm always reminded, I used to listen to my, my grandmother talk when I was a kid, and I, I didn't understand it then as a, as a kid, but I understand it now as I got a little older. And she would always say, you know, the older you get, the more people you, the more funerals you'll be going to. And uh, she wasn't wrong. <laughs> and uh, I'm getting, I guess I'm getting up there at that age where I'm going to more funerals. And uh, uh, I hate funerals, and I probably wouldn't go to my own if they didn't carry me there. <laughs> so make sure you go by and check on your, on your friends, your loved ones, people you're associated with. If you haven't seen them in a long time, uh, give them a phone call and say, hey, I'm just thinking about you. All right. Okay, let's start it with uh, the show with our scam alert. Now, I got a phone call from a friend of mine. He said, Keith, they're, they're at it, those scammers. Uh, they're trying to scam me on the, uh, on the Medicare. And he said these people are getting aggressive on the other end of the phone. Now, he realized it was a scam because uh, he watched the show and he understands that uh, Medicare is not going to call you and say they're going to cancel your, your Medicaid if you don't do uh, give them your number and uh, you're going to miss out on services and all that kind of stuff. He understood that was a scam. And so all you seniors out there who's, uh, who has a Medicare, if you get a phone call and the person on the other end is misrepresenting themselves as a Medicare um, uh, representative, uh, and they're asking you for personal information like your Medicare card number and some other personal information, don't give that out, all right? Now, Medicare has all this stuff on, on file as it is. Uh, simply hang up the phone because that is a scam. They're trying to scam you out of your information. And if you think you uh, should be dealing with Medicare, call the Medicare office yourself because most of the time, Medicare will send you a letter and you call them. So if you get this call and these people are real aggressive, even the phone number, it may be spoof. Now, we know what spoofing is. I said on the last show, that's where that number looks like it's coming from a Medicaid office, but it's not. The scammer has spoofed that number. So be very cautious and tell all your senior uh, friends out there, don't answer, don't give out that information when somebody calls you threatening to cut off your Medicare, threatening to do other things with your Medicare, hang the phone up. Don't get scammed, and, and, and don't, be, don't be afraid of these people because they're getting aggressive, uh, you know, and most seniors, you know, don't know, you know, they believe this is a Medicare representative, and it's not. Okay, so I don't want nobody to get scammed. Uh, in some local news here in uh, uh, Dayton, Ohio, the Miami Valley Child Development Center has uh, uh, consolidated, they're going to consolidate uh, four East Dayton locations into a $11 million center on 401 East Nass Nassau Street. And uh, construction and groundbreaking is only a few weeks away. Uh, the new center, it'll be called the Lincoln Hill Child and Family Center. And it'll serve about uh, 200 children. It'll have 14 classrooms. It'll have a full service kitchen. It'll have a health clinic, training spaces, and more. And that's a good thing, folks, because we need to invest in our children. We need to invest in our, the young kids, the older kids, and all those um, in between, because uh, we have to educate these, in, uh, these young people, because they are our future, 
And we don't want them growing up being, being dumb and stupid. We want them to be, um, you know, educated. And the earlier we get to them, the better. So I applied the, um, the, uh, the Miami Valley uh, Child Development. I applied them for the work they do and for this $11 um, new building, $11 million new building that they will be uh, going in real soon. And so I appreciate that. All the work done with young people, I appreciate that, you know. Um, well, let's give you some news on a story uh, that broke out of uh, Grand Rapids. And uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, that is. And you've seen the video. I don't know if we have the video. I think we do have a video of uh, Patrick Liola when he was pulled over for a traffic stop. Uh, Patrick jumped out of the car. Uh, he decided to run. The officer chased him down. A, uh, a scuffle ensued. Uh, the officer winds up on top of uh, Mr. Liola. He takes out his gun, points it at the back of his head, and shoots Mr. Uh, Liola right in the back of the head, and which result in killing him. Uh, the police officer's name is uh, Christopher Schur, and uh, the investigation is now underway. So the, the question is, is that why is it that it appears to be traffic stops turn into uh, someone's death? Because 99% of the videos that I've seen and, and, and that's been on the news, uh, it usually results in people of color end up dying in the hands of a police officer for just a routine traffic stop. And we need to ask the question, why is that? I mean, a traffic stop. I mean, so what if the man runs off? The officer has his car. <laughs> he know who he is. You run your plate, you know who he is. He can go to his house the next day and pick him up. As a matter of fact, the technology is so great these days, you can punch in information. They'll tell you exactly where the person works, where they live, where they work. So why couldn't you just go apprehend them another day? Why do you got to chase down the man? Why do you got to tussle with the man? And then why do you have to shoot the man point blank in the back of the head? Those are questions that we probably won't get answers to as much as we march, as much as we protest, as much as we call for police reform, as much as we call for police uh, accountability, as much as we call for some of these police officers to go to jail for killing unarmed citizens, I guess we got to continue on, folks. I guess we got to continue on and protest and make sure that uh, we get justice for the family of Mr. Loyola. So the next case is out of Syracuse, New York, and we, are, we do have a video of this. This is about the young man, the eight-year-old boy, who uh, stole a bag of uh, chips and these, one of the pastors by or whoever videotaped the young boy interaction with the police. The police had him and uh, one of the bystanders are saying, hey, why don't you let him go? I'll pay for the chips or something like that. You can see it on video. Well, here's what happened. And this is according to the mayor of Syracuse and he's responding to the video. And the mayor says, uh, Mayor Ben Wash, he said uh, of the video, which was recorded on Easter Sunday, the officers did not handcuff the boy. The officers knew the child from a prior interactions and explained to him that uh, he was being taken home. The officers returned the child to his family and discussed the incident with his father before leaving without filing any charges. So, and there's an investigation underway uh, for, for that uh, incident and the body cam and all that footage, which is what it's supposed to be. And so... Um, now, everybody know Benjamin Crump, right? Everybody heard of Benjamin Crump, the civil rights attorney who goes around representing uh, individuals whose been, uh, families has been dealing with uh, police uh, misconduct or, and or police crime. Now, I like Benjamin Crump, like him a lot, but here's the statement he made on his Twitter, Twitter account. He says, uh, Syracuse police officers detain an eight-year-old for allegedly stealing a bag of Doritos rather than taking him and handling an incident in a different way. And still, oh, it says, I'm, uh, and re rather than talking to him or handling this incident in a different way. The officers chose to escalate the incident and detain the boy, obviously terrified young boy, how traumatizing it is. So, Benjamin Crump, what you should have said was to that young boy, 
if you don't stop stealing, because that's breaking the law, then the police will arrest you. The police will put handcuffs on you. The police will read you your rights, and they will put you in the back of that cruiser. But this time, you won't be going home. You'll be going to jail. Because this eight-year-old boy needs to understand uh, right from wrong. And stealing is wrong. And Benjamin Crump should have made a better statement than what he made. Because the officers did talk to the young boy. The officers did talk to the boy in front of his parents. He took him home. And so we have to be careful when we speak on incidents like this. Because sometimes things can get blown way out of proportion. And I think that's what happened in this video. Things got way blown out of proportion. Was the little boy crying? Yeah, he was crying. You know why he's crying? <laughs> because they was taking him home to his parents. And he probably knew when that police cruiser pulls up and they knock on that door and he's standing there and the police standing there and they go in and tell his, his parents what he'd done, he knew he was in for it. <laughs> so I guess I'd be crying too. So the police take me home and tell my parents that I've been stealing. So uh, I just wanted to bring that up, folks, because, um, you know, we, we need to, we got to catch these young kids when they're young so they don't grow up and, and progress and uh, do some other crimes that get them thrown into jail. And keep, we got to keep them out of the system. All right? We got to keep them out of that prison, the pipeline system, as they call it. All right? So next story. This is also in New York. Now, I, I didn't realize this. When I, read, when I seen the headlines on this story, I was, I was surprised. It says, hate crimes in New York have risen 76% compared to the same period of time in 2021. It says, a new report from the New York Police Department Hate Crimes Task Force shows hate crimes in New York City has increased 76% when compared to the same time period in 2021, according to CNN. The incidents of a 19-year-old charged with hate crime against a Sikhi man in Queens, a 17-year-old boy charged with assault of a transgender girl, a man who was just uh, indicted for allegedly assaulting seven uh, Asian women. And so, you know, these crimes are going, y'all. Uh, it also, the report says, crimes against black people doubled, with the number of target incidents this year standing at 26 compared to 13 in the same period last year, according to the data. It also says that crimes uh, against targeting Jewish people increased from 28 crimes last year to 86 uh, so far in 2021. Uh, also, crimes targeting sexual orientation increased by 12, as noted by the report. It also goes on to say that uh, the data shows that hate crimes against Asians were down 32% compared to 2021 with 47 last year and 32 in the same period this year. So folks, we have to, those in leadership positions and those who are in responsible uh, positions, we have to be careful how we talk to each other because people are gravitating toward uh, hate. You know, you see it out of your elected leaders. You see them talking crazy, finger pointing, name calling. We didn't see this out of leaders some 10 years ago. All of a sudden, these Congress uh, members, they act a fool. Uh, you see some TV reporting. Uh, they always name calling and finger pointing. That doesn't help us in society. We all in this thing together, folks. And the only way we're going to fix it is together. And let me be mindful of some of these people giving you this information. These talking heads on TVs, these people are millionaires. They live in communities which you can't even drive your street down, can't drive down that street, right? So these people are not affected by this. The people who are affected by this are the everyday people. Those are the ones that are affected. These millionaires, these talking heads, you think they care about the average uh, uh, worker on the street? Heck no. The only thing they care about is their ratings because their ratings lends them to receive more money on their contracts. So they plan us for fools, y'all. <laughs> and some people are falling for it. They're falling for it. They love to point the finger. Oh, it's the whites. Oh, it's the blacks. Oh, it's the Jewish. Oh, it's the Asians. Oh, it's the Democrats. Oh, it's the Republicans. Where does that get you? What does that get you? Make you feel good? 
That would make you feel good. <laughs> so we got to change the conversation, folks. We can disagree with folks without name-calling individuals. We have to if we're going to get this society together. Um, in Florida, I don't know what's going on in Florida, but I do know the governor has lost his mind. Uh, Ron DeSantis, he's lost his mind completely. Uh, in Florida, they rejected more than 50 math textbooks, citing critical race theory as one of the reasons. Now, <laughs> the, uh, the, the Department of uh, Education in Florida has said that 54 out of 132 textbooks submitted would be rejected and not be added because they did not comply with Florida's new standard of, uh, of prohibit topics, including critical race theories. That means that 41% of the textbooks submitted were rejected. And that makes the most in history of Florida. Um, also, it goes on to say that, uh, let, me, let me clarify something. Let me give you a definition of what critical race theory is. Critical race theory aims to look at how racism has modeled every um, part of American society, as such as public policies and institutions, and as of the justice system. Now, critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 schools. I'll say it again. Critical race theory is not taught in K through 12 school. It's a college course. All right, I've said it once before, I'll say it again. Critical race theory, including Florida, and Ron DeSantis know this, he know it's not taught in K through 12 schools. You got it? So why is he trying to ban critical race theory and it's not taught in the schools? It's a political stunt. That's all. It's a political stunt because the average person on the street who's against critical race theory don't even know what it is. But they're against it. <laughs> we don't like that critical race theory. You say, what is it? Uh, 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 I'll get back with you. <laughs> so, so yeah, okay, it goes on. Okay, now, now this anti-critical race theory efforts has reached over 35 states in the United States. And Florida has been the most active in trying to completely ban critical race theories from the school by passing bills to protect white teachers from white guilt. That's what they're trying to protect teachers from, y'all. <laughs> White guilt. Hey, that's what the reports say. I'm just reading it. <laughs> now, don't ask me what right, white guilt is. I have no idea. <laughs> that's one I don't know. All right? So, it also goes on to say it's going to restrict how students learn about slavery and the ongoing impacts of racism. Ah, folks, let me tell you something. You know, <laughs> we have folks right here in this state who is running for political office. They also say critical race theory was terrible. They're going to ban critical race theory. You're going to ban it from the college because it's not taught in schools. So that's the question we should ask. I wish I could get in some of these press conferences with some of these guys like, like this, this Governor DeSantis, I wish I could get in there and say, okay, you're going to ban critical race theory, right? And, and, and that, that politician, I know it's right because that's what you said on your, on your ad when you run it, all right? So, are you going to ban it in college? Because <laughs> that's where it's taught. And if, it's, if you do know a school that's teaching critical race theory in K-12, let me know, and I'll report on it. Let me know. Let me know if there's a school out there, K through 12, is teaching critical race theory. Now, don't get critical race theory mixed up with uh, black history, right? Or American history. That's a separate category, right? That's history detailing how people were treated in this country, all right? So, maybe y'all can inform me of which school is teaching critical race theory besides the universities. Uh, Joy Reid also said when uh, the governor was signing this anti-critical race theory bill, the governor of DeSantis, that is, Joy Reid is an MS MSNBC reporter. And Joy Reid said at the time that uh, the governor of DeSantis was signing this anti-critical um, race theory bill that he had some black kids, little black boys up there, behind him with signs 
that, had, that said anti-CRT, black kids now. Joy Reid said that uh, these, uh, these signs that the governor uh, had these kids holding was tantamount to child abuse. Now, DeSantis' office answered back and they said, hey, uh, the spokesperson was this Christina Pushaw. She said the children understood that they were supporting a legislation that opposed critical race theory, the study of systematic racism. These kids are eight years old, folks. These kids don't know what critical race theory is. Why didn't they get permission from the kids' parents to say whether or not they want their kid to stand behind DeSantis holding up a critical race, anti-critical race theory sign? You see, so, so in this Governor DeSantis, I guess they putting him out there to be the next um, Donald Trump, uh, I guess, because he's about as ignorant as Donald Trump. And people gravitate toward that ignorance because it, you know, that bluster because it make him look tough. He's a tough guy. Tough guy. That's what Ron DeSantis is. Tough. No, Ron DeSantis is stupid. Um, look here, folks. When you have black children standing, beside, uh, standing behind one of the most racist governors in the state, I mean, in, in the United States, holding anti-critical race theory signs, and these kids don't know what they was, what they was holding that, what that sign meant. I know they don't know what it meant. You got adults don't know what critical race theory is, so how, how are the kids going to know? Because it's not taught to them in the school because they don't teach it in the school, right? So, so, so folks, look, be careful about having your kids used as political props is what this comes down to. And Ron DeSantis, that governor ought to be ashamed of himself for using these kids as props. And if I was the parents of, of, uh, of these kids, I'd be suing the governor. And what Joey Reed said, child abuse, that's what I, I'll be suing him some kind of way because he wouldn't use my kid as a political prop. All right, we're moving on, folks. Moving on. Um, this, uh, the HUD secretary, Marsha Fudge, she said uh, there will be punishment for racial bias in home appraisals. Remember I did a story about home appraisals, how black um, home owner, owners appraisal, home appraisal was, was real low, and that's because they were of the black-owned home. And I, I ran a story where a black couple had a low-ball appraisal, okay? They knew a white friend of theirs, so what they did was they, the, uh, the black couple took all their pictures down, all right? Uh, the white, white friend of theirs uh, had the appraisal come. She told the appraiser that the house was hers, and that appraiser jumped the appraisal price up almost uh, fifty thousand dollars. <laughs> then what they gave the black couple. So uh, this racial bias and home appraisal do exist, and uh, Marsha Fudge, along with President uh, uh, Joe Biden, has pledged to uh, put uh, money into the agency to make sure that uh, these people are held accountable, and that's a good thing. As a matter of fact, the Department of Housing and Urban Development uh, has uh, released an uh, uh, equity action plan, which includes a robust agenda, agenda to address the racial discrimination in housing. Uh, this issue also has its own line in President Biden's fiscal year 2023 budget in the amount of $86 million in grants earmarks to prevent and redress housing discrimination. See folks, Joe Biden ain't just talking to talk, he's doing some things. You know, he's, got his, he's got his cabinet and they're trying to uh, tackle issues that hasn't been tackled in about four years since the last guy was in the White House and didn't do crap. So, um, here's what I want to point out. Uh, Joe Biden's approval rating. Uh, you see all this stuff on TV about Joe Biden's approval rating is down, it's down, it's down, it's down. Well, here, let me, let me read this report, folks. President, Biden, Joe, I mean, yeah, President Joe Biden's approval rating had reached a new low, just 40%, uh, according to a Reuters poll uh, published a couple days ago. Now, it goes on to say it matches former President Donald Trump's approval rating at the same period and stage in their presidency. You got it, folks? See, these talking heads on TV, they, they leave that part out. They say the approval rating is low. Joe Biden's approval rating is low. But they leave out the part that it's the same as Donald Trump's approval rating at the same stage in their presidency. 
There you go. <laughs> Let me move on. Now, that's just one poll. The other poll, uh, Mammoth University poll, has the same thing. It shows Biden and Trump had identical approval ratings. I'll give you another poll if you don't like that one. Another one. Uh, 538 tracks Biden approval rating, and analy they analyze various polls by using their own system of poll rating, and they gave uh, Biden's approval rating at 42.2% as of March the 22, while 52.8% of Americans disapprove of his presidency. Now, this uh, 538 also, this poll also says that Trump had an approval rating of 40.7 as of March the 23rd in 2018. And so also Trump's uh, disapproval rating was 53.2%. So folks, when you hear these people talking about Joe Biden's approval rating is so low and of his presidency, just remind them that Donald Trump's was the same. And I'd have shut that argument up. <laughs> you got it? That'll shut that down, folks, big time. Trust me. Trust me on that one. Okay. Yeah, you hear all this talk about inflation. Inflation is going off, off, inflation, inflation. Everybody doing something about inflation. Why ain't anybody doing something about inflation? Well, hold on. Let me give you what, what is inflation. Inflation is a general price increase of goods and services uh, gradually over time. Inflation can occur when prices rise due to an increase in production costs, such as new raw materials and wages. A surge in demand for products and services can cause inflation as customers are willing to pay more for product. It goes on to say, a stronger economy generates inflation. You got that? A stronger economy generates inflation. So, uh, the more people that, that buy goods, the higher demand on goods, usually companies meet the increased demand by increasing uh, supply of goods. So, I told you about price gouging, folks, and that's what these companies are doing. Now, you say, well, what can be done? I'm glad you asked that question. I think I asked that question. <laughs> so, uh, what can be done? Now, from the government side, uh, one thing that helps improve the supply chain so that goods can reach the U.S. faster. Now, in October, the, uh, the Biden administration worked on some of the biggest ports in the United States to improve speed in which, uh, pro uh, in which processing shipping containers. Now, they announced the expansion of operation of the Port of Los Angeles and also supported running these ports 24 hours a day to help relieve blockade goods. Now, improving the supply chain can help bring more goods and decrease prices. Now, I said that for various reasons, because we get these people, these talking heads, and they always want to talk about what inflation. They always say, oh, inflation is terrible. Okay, so what's your recommendation to reduce inflation? You don't have an answer for that, right? The government has limited ability. The inflation comes from these corporations who jack the price up, right? And so when you hear these talking heads or you see these politicians, they talk about inflation. Ah, oh, inflation is terrible. Inflation is terrible. Well, okay, so what are you going to do about it? Don't tell me how terrible it is. Give me your solution, right? That's like down at the, at the border. We hear all this talk about the border. Ah, oh, the border is terrible. All these people coming over from the border. Okay, so what's your solution? Because when Donald Trump was president, it didn't stop him. They still came. He locked them up, separate the families, which is the most inhumane thing you can possibly do. Putting kids in the cages and then sending their parents somewhere, that's the most insane thing you can do. And people still came. They came in big numbers. So what's your solution to that? So, so the question is, folks, you can talk about issues. You can talk about, hey, this is, you can label all the issues we got. But if you don't have a solution to it, you are not helpful. Not helpful at all, people. And there lays the problem. As a matter of fact, here in the state of Ohio, there was a Republican legislator who introduced a piece of legislation to lower 
the gas sell tax. I thought that was helpful. I thought that was real helpful. But Governor DeWine said he would not sign or support that piece of legislation. Now, you got to ask yourself why, or you got to ask the governor why. At this day and age, with the gas prices are so high that a Republican representative at the State House in Ohio presented a piece of legislation to lower the gas sale tax. Governor DeWine, who is a Republican, said he would not support that piece of legislation. And yet, Governor DeWine, right, he's up for re-election, is running ads talking about inflation. <laughs> so when he has the opportunity to do something about inflation, he don't. See, I wish I could get into these press conferences. Matter of fact, I wish I could have DeWine here and do an interview with him. You know, there won't be no gotcha interview. I just ask him a question. Uh, what are you doing about the drug prices? What are you doing about gas prices? What are you doing about prescription prices? What are you doing about health care prices? And then they got the nerve to say, this is Governor DeWine, oh, we're we going to bring more jobs. People ain't working the jobs now. <laughs> Employers having a hard time finding people to work all these jobs we got now. So jobs definitely ain't the answer at this stage. Pay is. You're going to pay some folks something. Where's your plan to hike up the living wage? Any of these people. You talk about jobs. Yeah, we got jobs. We got jobs coming out the yin yang. We don't have enough people coming out the yin yang to take the jobs. So don't come to me talking about you're going to create more jobs. We don't need more jobs. We need more people to take the jobs that's already out there. We need some people to take the jobs and also give them a living wage so they don't have to work four or five jobs to support their family. We need some folks to get some, some insurance in here where they can afford you know, to go to work. That's what we need, you know, and in fairness to uh, uh, Mayor Whaley, who's running for the governor, ex-Mayor Whaley of City of Dayton. She's running against Mike DeWine, and uh, maybe I can get both of them in there, and uh, we can have a, a debate. Maybe we can have a debate right here, and I'll be the moderator. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen. I doubt if Mike DeWine show up, you know what I mean, because sometimes they don't like the questions I ask because uh, the questions are too pointed, and uh, they, can't they can't answer the question. Because I got one question I asked them. Why don't you support this decrease in this gas tax? There's no reason for that, folks. And they got infrastructure money. If he says, well, we got, that money goes to the bridges and the roads, you got infrastructure money to cover that already. So you don't need it there. All right. Let me show this video of uh, that I... Uh, that I came across, it was three years ago. I was down at the Dayton City Commission. And uh, I want you to take a look at this, uh, this video and uh, I'll come back on the other side. I am a uh, concerned citizen, a community activist, or whatever you want to call me, but I try to pay attention to what's happening, not only locally. And uh, what I'm about to tell you, it, it kind of seems far-fetched, but it's an uh, actual bill that was introduced in the State House. The bill number is 174. And uh, some states call it constitutional carry, it deals with the uh, right to uh, carry a concealed firearm. What this bill would do, it would end the requirements that people have to go through background checks. It will end the eight hours training to uh, carry a, to get a permit to carry a concealed weapon. It would also end the uh, requirement that people carrying a concealed weapon have to notify, notify police when they're stopped. And it also would include and those not only handguns, but also you, in this bill, you can carry and conceal a rifle and shotgun. So, as it stands, about 16 states have already adopted uh, this, uh, this piece of legislation. Uh, it's been introduced at the State House last month. Uh, I would say this is a no-brainer that uh, we, this bill does not do anything to protect the citizens. It don't do anything to protect the police. Matter of fact, it's put everybody in danger. And uh, we already see when unarmed citizens end up getting shot by the police, the first thing the police officers say, we thought he had a weapon. This gives them legal, legal justification to shoot first and ask questions later. I'm all for good policing. I'm not for rural cops. I'm not for cops to go against the, um, uh, the policies or the law. And I think this bill lends itself to that. And uh, I come to ask the commission, I know Mayor Whaley, your voice,
Congress not only speaks locally but nationally. Uh, also, I know the uh, state FOP has spoken out against this, this bill, and uh, I'd like to hear whether or not the local FOP and the police chief can uh, also lend a hand in uh, opposing this thing because we got a new governor, and this governor is not like the last governor. If you thought the last governor or something, this guy here is something else too. Uh, he's signing bills that make you scratch your head. That's to say, why you sign them? And uh, there are some folks out there that believe that this uh, piece of legislation just gets to his desk. He's going to sign it. This puts everybody in danger. We're trying to reduce gun violence, not to enhance it. This bill enhances gun violence, and it makes the whole community unsafe. So I want the, um, the community to know, especially the uh, <coughs> governor and the two individuals that uh, introduced this bill. It's House Bill 174. We need to get, on, get involved because it's been induced. It goes to the committee, and then, of course, it goes to a vote. And I guarantee you, the House is dominated by Republicans, and they're just itching to get this thing signed and get it done. Hopefully, with the outcry from the public, we can stop it. Okay, see, that was three years ago, folks, and I talked about this bill back then. It was called the Constitutional Carry. And as you've seen on the video, what that bill would do, I mean, what that, uh, yeah, what that bill would do, as of right now, Governor DeWine signed that piece of legislation into law. Okay? And so he allowed more people to put more guns all over the streets in the state of Ohio. All right. Why do I bring this up? Because Governor DeWine came to Dayton after the shooting in the uh, Dayton, Oregon district. After that shooting, those people died. They had a, they had a big uh, uh, rally, and Dave Chappelle, everybody came to town. And uh, Governor DeWine stood on that stage, and people shouted, do something, do something. And Governor DeWine said, oh, I'm going to put some legislation in place to try to get a handle on this, this, uh, this, these, these guns, gun control. He didn't do jack, folks. He went back to Columbus. He signed a piece of legislation that puts the police officers in danger, that put the public in danger, and, and it has the possibility of putting more guns on the street. This is his record. I ain't making this stuff up for, for people. I'm pointing it out. And we shouldn't tolerate this. And next time I see Governor DeWine, I'll bring it up to his face. Because I like to go face to face. I don't have them, folks. What I say on camera, I'll say it to their face. Governor DeWine, you didn't live up to your promise. You failed those people and those families who, uh, who was involved in that tragedy in the Oregon district. You failed those people. You failed all those people who were chanting for you to do something, Governor DeWine. You failed those people. And you sided up with the gun lobbyists who give you money so we know where your priorities are. And you up for re-election, Governor DeWine. And people say, why are you hard on Governor DeWine? Because Governor DeWine has the power to do something about issues that will affect us here in the state of Ohio. That's how important this thing is, people. That's how important this thing is. So I just wanted to bring that up. You know, it burns me up to have these politicians run around here like they're doing good, and then turn around and sign a bill that is no good. So, if you see the Governor DeWine around, tell him I'm looking for him. I want to give him an interview on the show. He can come on the show. He can bring whoever he want to bring. I'll even forward the questions to him. <laughs> so, so he'll have the questions in advance. I ain't trying to trick him. You know what I mean? So we'll see where that goes. I guarantee you he won't come. <laughs> so I bet uh, Mayor Whaley will. I bet Mayor Whaley will come. She's running for governor. I bet she'll come on the invite to the show because she's got nothing to hide and she's doing things to try to help out those uh, people here in the state of Ohio. But I'll let you know who shows up and who don't. You got it? Okay. So look here, I'm going to close with this before I say some things that I shouldn't say about the governor. <laughs> so, but look here, folks. Um, call your loved ones if you haven't seen them or heard from them in a while because uh, you never know. You never know when the times come, and you may not see them again alive. So, until next time, may God bless you and your family.